Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heitinger, and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar, familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to foster, stimulate, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club hosts over 150 free programs, including exhibitions, readings, musical performances, and lectures. To find out more about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce our most international program yet. As we dive into the world of Leonardo da Vinci, it is my pleasure to introduce two extraordinary scholars and curators. Zoya Kupceva, the curator of Italian painting from the 13th to 16th century at the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, Russia, and Vincent Delievin, the chief curator of Italian 16th century paintings at the Louvre in Paris, France. The program will be moderated by Helen Stoilas, Editor Americas at the Art Newspaper. Thank you, Helen. The program is presented in partnership with the National Arts Club, the State Hermitage Museum, the Hermitage Museum Foundation, the Louvre, and the American Friends of the Louvre. Thank you to everyone involved for making this event possible. Following the conversation will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function to pose any questions you might have. And without further ado, let me pass the baton on to Helen. Please enjoy the program. Nadine, and of course a big thank you to the National Arts Club for organizing the event and to our panelists for sharing their time and expertise. And to everyone out there in our big new digital neighborhood, um, thank you for joining this discussion. Um, today we'll be talking to about the Musée du Louvre's blockbuster Leonardo da Vinci exhibition, celebrating the 500th anniversary of the artist's death in France. The show broke an attendance record at the Paris Institution this year with 1.1 million visitors over its four month run, ending on 24 February. Um, now, I'm sure it feels like a lifetime ago to, talk, to think about a massive crowd puller like this, uh, but the show took years to organize and it was a major diplomatic challenge to secure loans from public and private collections around the world. In the end, four paintings by the master's own hand, the Benoit Madonna from the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, La Scopigliata from the National Gallery in Parma, the portrait of a musician from the Ambrosian Library in Milan, and the Vatican St. Jerome joined the five works the Louvre itself owns, um, the Belle Ferroniere, the Virgin of the Rocks, St. John the Baptist, the Virgin and Child with St. Anne, and of course the Mona Lisa, although she stayed in her usual perch. Um, with Leonardo's related drawings, scientific writing, and other works on paper, such as the famous Vitruvian Man on loan from Venice, around 160 works were on display, which is a phenomenal achievement, um, considering how, how difficult it is to, to get all those works together. Vincent, could you give us an overview of the show and tell us a bit about the research the Louvre did on its own works? There was a lot of scientific work done, including chemical analysis of the paint layers and infrared imaging. What did you discover? And I know you have, you have some slides you're gonna be showing us. So um, can you kind of talk us through the, the scientific work? Yes, with uh, great pleasure. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me and uh, I'm very happy to, to, to speak about that uh, exhibition. Uh, I would like really to insist uh, on the fact uh, that uh, uh, the exhibition was, uh, has been organized uh, to celebrate uh, the artist's death in France 500 years ago in uh, 1519. You know, for us, uh, it is a, a very important celebration because uh, when uh, Leonardo died, his last masterpieces entered the royal collection and this was uh, the real beginning of our great national collection, which is today uh, the Louvre collection. As you know, uh, each museum uh, has its own story uh, its personality and uh, the collection uh, of the Louvre is uh, probably mainly characterized by uh, its great collection of uh, Leonardo da Vinci's work. Uh, the Louvre in a certain way is uh, Leonardo's house. Uh, in fact, uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, had strong relationships with the French. Uh, he first met the King of France, uh, Louis XII in 1499 
And later, uh, he was invited uh, by the new king of France, Francis I, to settle uh, at his court. The artist moved uh, to the kingdom where he lived his uh, last years from uh, 1516 uh, to his death, the 2nd of May uh, 1519. And uh, the strong relationship uh, between uh, Leonardo uh, and the French explain why uh, our country host today the greatest collection of works by Leonardo da Vinci in the world. Uh, the Louvre has the immense uh, honor uh, to preserve five original paintings by Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, we can have a look at them. Uh, please, next uh, slide. Um, first, we have the, the first version of the Virgin of the Rocks. Here is uh, the, the poster of the exhibition, uh, Leonardo da Vinci with the Belle Ferronniere. We'll speak a lot about the a little more about the, that painting, but let's have a look at the next uh, slide with the, the two first painting which enter the Royal Collection. Uh, you can see the first version of the Vision of the Rocks and uh, the portrait of a lady, the so-called Belle Ferronniere. And then we have also uh, next uh, the three last works painted by the master uh, on the next slide. Uh, the paintings he kept uh, until his death, the Saint John the Baptist, the Saint Anne and uh, the uh, famous Mona Lisa. I would like uh, to remind you that uh, Leonardo da Vinci painted just a few works during his uh, quite long life. Uh, today we know between 15 and 17 paintings which are attributed to him with quite uh, great confidence. And so five paintings, the five paintings of the Louvre represent almost uh, like a third of his entire work. The Louvre exhibition uh, has been prepared during a quite long period, about 10 years, with my colleague, Louis Franck, uh, who is uh, chief curator at the drawing uh, department. Uh, it could seem like a, a long time. Why did it took uh, so much time? First, uh, because uh, a lot has been written on uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and it was absolutely necessary to make a synthesis on that large uh, bibliography. It was also necessary to uh, revisit the archive documents on the artist uh, in order to propose a reliable reconstruction of his, like, of his life uh, and, uh, and work. But one of the most uh, exciting parts of the preparation of the exhibition was certainly to revisit the works themselves, thanks to uh, new scientific investigation and thanks also to uh, conservation, conservation treatment. All our collection of uh, 22 drawings and also our five paintings have been studied in our uh, laboratory with a new equipment. Uh, new X-rays, uh, new infrared reflectography uh, were done, but also, uh, have a look at the next slide, uh, a new kind of uh, investigation, what we call uh, the scanning XRF, which uh, provides chemical element maps of the painting uh, all of this uh, uh, was done, and I show you here uh, the, the chemical maps of the uh, so-called Belle Ferronniere. Uh, I will speak more uh, uh, later on that, uh, on that painting. Thanks to uh, this uh, scientific investigation, we were able to understand in a much better way the pictorial evolution of each painting, because we discovered the changes made by the artist during the execution. This is particularly uh, important because Leonardo preferred to paint only a few works he kept with him uh, for quite a long period in order to uh, perfect them. And thanks to these new uh, scientific images, we discovered the long genesis of each painting, the evolution of the story represented, but also the changes uh, of the forms. One thing very important was also to, to restore several uh, works and I would like to remind that uh, we worked on uh, the same time. Next uh, slide. Uh, we restored the painting uh, between 2010 and 12. You can see uh, uh, the difference in, in an easy way. Uh, uh, then we worked uh, on the Belle Ferronniere in 2014-15. Uh, Next uh, slide. You can see here also the great, quite great difference thanks to uh, uh, thinning the varnish uh, uh, on, the, on the painting. And, and finally, the St. John the Baptist in 2016, next slide. Here also you can see the, quite the difference. It, he was uh, very yellow and now uh, less yellow, more um, uh, uh, white uh, color. 
all these uh, uh, conservation, conservation treatment were uh, very important to understand the technique uh, of the artist. So uh, the exhibition was the, like the conclusion of all that work done uh, during years. The main thesis uh, of the exhibition was to uh, reaffirm the importance uh, of paintings for Leonardo. You know, uh, in, uh, in recent years, some scholars uh, expressed reservation on that point. For them, Leonardo was uh, as much a painter as a scientist, and painting was only one of his activities, maybe not the most important. Sometimes uh, the poor number of paintings done during his long life has been used uh, as uh, an argument to demonstrate that uh, it was not something uh, as important as we could imagine. Uh, the exhibition, the Louvre exhibition, wanted to claim the contrary. When reading uh, the writings of Leonardo, you understand how important painting was for him. It was the main science, superior to all uh, other uh, sciences. The supreme science based on all the other sciences, uh, mathematics, uh, geometry, uh, astronomy, botany, and many other fields. The exhibition uh, wanted to present the very original method of work of the artist in four chapters. First one, uh, we call Shadow and Light, was devoted uh, to his use when he decided to become a painter and made his apprenticeship with uh, Andrea del Verrocchio uh, in one of the best workshops in uh, Renaissance Florence. There, he learned to give to his paintings a sculptural uh, character. The second chapter of the exhibition was called Liberty. It wanted to show uh, his first uh, maturity at the end of the 1470s when he started to represent not only uh, the form of nature and man, but also the movement. It was a new manner uh, illustrated by the wonderful uh, Benoit Madonna from the Hermitage. The third chapter, and maybe we can uh, have a look at the next slide, the third chapter was called Science. And it showed that uh, during the 1480s, Leonardo understood that if he wanted to reproduce nature in the best way, he must study nature in a scientific way. And this is when he started to uh, investigate our world, all its components, as you can see uh, in this wonderful uh, drawing from the Royal Collection, which was on display uh, in the exhibition, in which was the introduction of the third part, uh, the, the science uh, chapter of the exhibition. But uh, if Leonardo was um, fascinated by science, he never forgot painting. Science was a way to painting. This conception uh, of the art of painting led him to become probably uh, the main artist of his time, the pioneer of what the contemporaries called the modern manner. And this was the fourth chapter of the exhibition called Life. Leonardo uh, was probably the first to reproduce perfectly nature, not only uh, in its uh, external forms, but also in its uh, internal strengths and the human feelings. And to uh, illustrate uh, this idea, I would like to focus uh, not on the uh, famous Mona Lisa, but on the Belle Ferronniere. Next uh, slide. Uh, the Belle Ferronniere, which was chosen as uh, the posture uh, of the exhibition. So you know that, uh, unfortunately, the, the identity of the woman remains today a, a mystery. She is known as the Belle Ferronniere, the famous mistress of the King Francis I. But this is clearly a mistake. Uh, in fact, we are quite sure that she's not a French woman, but an Italian woman, most probably an important member of the court of the Duke of Milan, uh, Ludovico il Moro, uh, which was the Duke of Milan at the end of the 15th century. He was a patron of, uh, of Leonardo da Vinci. She is, in fact, uh, very uh, elegantly dressed uh, at the, what they called at that time the Spanish manner, uh, and at that time it was in fashion uh, in Milan. It has been suggested that she could be one of the Duke's mistress or the wife of his nephew, but unfortunately, as I told you, it remains a, a mystery. In this portrait, uh, Leonardo uh, abandoned the traditional composition in profile, which was dominant uh, at the court of Milan. Maybe we can have a look at the next uh, slide. At the next slide, uh, I show you for comparison uh, on uh, your left, you can see the portrait of Bianca Maria Sforza by uh, Ambrogio de Predis. It's a painting, a wonderful painting uh, uh, in the National Gallery in Washington. And you can see, you can make a comparison. Uh, here you can see how uh, Leonardo prefers a more uh, lively composition 
with the figure uh, in movement in front of us. Uh, the bust is seen between uh, profile and three quarters. Uh, uh, the face is almost uh, uh, face on, and the eyes uh, look slightly towards, towards uh, our right. The master wants uh, to represent the model uh, in a physical movement, which is also uh, a psychological uh, movement. He proposes, in fact, a psychological portrait of that woman. And this is a revolution done by Leonardo, thanks to his knowledge of nature, thanks to his capacity to reproduce uh, nature and life in its uh, entirety, and not only the external form, but also the human uh, feelings. That was uh, the main thesis uh, um, developed uh, in the exhibition. And that's it for, for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. That's very, um, that's very um, interesting to, to hear about all those works. Um, Zoya, uh, the, the Hermitage Museum lent its lovely Benoit Madonna, which uh, Vincent mentioned, the show. And this is a work that very rarely leaves the museum. Um, and it's also got a fascinating history, including a rumor that it came to St. Peter Petersburg with a troupe of Italian circus performers, which I think is amazing. Um, can you tell us a bit about it and, and how, how, um, how it was lent for this show? Um, uh, good evening or good morning, um, my call, dear colleagues, and good morning and good evening, everyone uh, from St. Petersburg. Um, I'm really glad to, to take part in such talk about Leonardo and um, I need to say that um, this is a very special moment uh, to discuss our uh, painting Benoit Madonna. As you remember, we have two uh, paintings of Leonardo in our collection, but um, the second one, uh, Madonna Lita, was uh, exhibited in the exhibition in Milan in the Museum Paul di Pizzoli. But we touch um, the, um, the problem uh, of uh, traveling of our painting um, outside from the Hermitage. Um, we have many reasons why this painting um, doesn't travel uh, because um, the main reason, um, because it was transferred from panel uh, to canvas and it is very fragile. We will discuss it a little bit later, but actually um, uh, the, that was a legend uh, when uh, the painting came in our in country um, with Italian troops, uh, but uh, we think um, we cannot prove it, but we know another story. Um, the history is that the painting came in our um, country uh, around uh, mid of the 18th century. We cannot say exactly uh, in what time, but um, ex around mid of the 18th century. Could you please show the in, uh, Helen next slide? Um, yeah, this is the um, very famous image of our painting. And you can see very massive um, frame, which was uh, specially uh, made for this painting by family Benoit. We believe that it was made by Benoit family for exhibition uh, of the um, uh, special exhibition of private paintings in St. Petersburg, which was in the beginning of the 20th century. And you can see that the painting has um, very different uh, names. Um, the official name is Madonna with a flower, or Madonna and child with flower, and um, Beno is a family name of the last owners. And as you can see, it was painted especially um, by Leonardo for some kind of a private chapel, some private devotional image. But unfortunately, we cannot say exactly the name of a person who commissioned this painting. And this is very um, difficult problem for us. But what we can say that this panel, let's say it was panel for the beginning, that this panel was very um, popular and known. And we even can say that Raphael Santi had replica copy of um, this painting when he was, we think when he was in Florence, but he was in Florence um, in the beginning of the 16th century, that was uh, 1504 or 06. Well, we can say that this time this panel was in Florence. And um, what we can say about it, that when it was painted, Leonardo was approximately 26, 20 years, years old. And he was mm, young, let's say. Um, 
but uh, he just left uh, his um, uh, work the workshop of uh, Andrea del Verrocchio and he became an independent artist and um, maybe that was some kind of his um, let's say not the first um, uh, object uh, being separately from uh, Verrocchio but some kind of very early uh, painting and when it came in our um, when it came in St. Petersburg could you show um, next slide please Helen uh, when it came in St. Petersburg, it came in the 18th century, but um, as I mentioned before, the last name of the last owners is um, Benoit family. Actually, um, the owner was Leon Benoit, who was originally an um, architect. This is a very famous family name in St. Petersburg. Leon Benoit is an architect and he constructed, designed many uh, uh, very special buildings in our city. And his wife, Mary, you can see uh, her uh, family name, Sapozhnikova. She was originally from uh, Russians. And that was some kind of a dowry <laughs> of uh, Maria Sapozhnikova, uh, who got it from uh, his family, her family, uh, Sapozhnikov. And um, when it came in St. Petersburg, the reason was um, the marriage between uh, Leon Benoit and Mary, uh, it came without name. The, the Sapochnikov believed this is the, uh, of course, Leonardo da Vinci, but uh, no more scholars believed because a uh, few, many centuries we didn't know about this painting and suddenly it's appeared in St. Petersburg as Madonna of Leonardo da Vinci. And um, you can see the right uh, photograph of our curator who is very um, special in our history in the beginning of the 20th century before revolution and he was also uh, a very short time curator in the Soviet period, uh, Ernst Liebhardt, his father, he was expert in Leonardo um, paintings and he used to live um, in Florence and Ernst von Liebhardt, his son, he was um, educated is a very well educated and he was painter at the same time and um, he recognized when he came in russia he um, was responsible for private collections he was like an agent antiquarian legend uh, agent for um uh, some imperial uh, family um, members and he of course he knew various private collections in saint petersburg and he visited uh, different collectors and he recognized straight uh, that this is Leonardo. That was the first step that Liebhardt um, found, discovered Leonardo in the private collection of St. Petersburg. The second step was how to prove it, that this is Leonardo. Of course, we know about it, this is Leonardo, but we need to prove. Um, well, um, the, the story is um, a little bit common to many stories in the beginning of the 20th century and uh, 21st century. When we discover some painting, we try to prove that this is an original and this is a very famous name. Um, what Liebgert had done, he attracted, he invited uh, different uh, specialists to St. Petersburg. Um, he wanted to show this painting and also family Benoit, Leon uh, Benoit and Alexander Benoit, his brother, um, they traveled to Paris uh, to, of course, to show this painting to specialists in Paris. And uh, mm, we know that Bernard Berenson, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, he um, uh, saw this painting and he wanted to, to, to buy it uh, for American collection. And we also know that um, Bode uh, knew this painting, he saw and Marani, very famous names uh, of uh, scholars who came and St. Petersburg just to look at this painting. And uh, not all, of course, but the majority of uh, scholars, they accepted that this is Leonardo. And that was the second step uh, to prove and to show to scholars. And after, when uh, mm, uh, various scholars recognized this is Leonardo, um, Family Benoit uh, got uh, different um, interesting suggestions and ideas to, to sell it. Uh, and we want, and, and the Hermitage was not the first uh, organization, the first company, let's say, who want, uh, which wanted to buy this painting. And, but uh, Leon Benoit and Maria, they were some kind of a patriots and um, they wanted to sell it to the Imperial collection. And you can see uh, the first publication of um, 
painting of Madonna Benoit, and you could see the date. And uh, um, could you see, um, could we show the um, next uh, slide, please? Just um, a few images uh, to show um, the origin of this painting. This is a very interesting uh, slide because I think it's a little bit funny because these are brothers of Sapozhnikovs who were owners of this Madonna Benoit before. And this is their um, uh, company in Astrakhan in the south of Russia of a caviar fishing. And next slide, please. And uh, maybe next, uh, Helen, please. Yes, this is very interesting image. Um, now, uh, you can see, uh, no, no, the previous one, please. Yes, uh, in the left side, you can see the building of a new, the New Hermitage Museum, which was constructed by Nicholas I, especially for public as a museum, Imperial. But in the right side, you can see in the right corner, a very special uh, postcard. I think Vincent will like it much because you can see uh, um, in the left corner, Madonna Benoit, uh, just the second from the left. The fourth from the left, you can see Boltrafio, uh, which was in the exhibition of Louvre, and which is in the Moscow now. And the right side, you can see in the right corner, you can see uh, Raphael and uh, Madonna Alba, which was sold sold out from the Imperial collection and now it's in the National Gallery of Washington. And what I wanted to say that um, Madonna Benoit came in the Imperial collection in uh, 1914. This is the last very special painting um, which was bought by Imperial family. And after we had the First World War, we had the revolution and uh, many private collections were nationalized and um, um, the Soviet government even paid the rest of a sum for Benoit family. They were responsible to pay her money for this painting. And now we can date this postcard as like after 1914 and before, let's say, 1920, because after we change our exhibition, um, our museum. Could you show, please, a um, uh, few images, next images? Uh, Helen. Yes, this is um, the present time, like you can, you can see our Madonna Bieno and Madonna Lita all together in the Great Hermitage building. And the next, please. And um, the, the, uh, yes. uh, I just wanted to touch this uh, very special problem, uh, which I mentioned before. This painting was transferred and um, that was common in the imperial collection uh, in the 19th century, but it was transferred when, when it was in uh, the private collection in the beginning of the 19th century. And you can see that the back of a painting where you can see it's written that it was transferred. And it was first of all transferred and after in the early Soviet times, the back was, um, mm, how to say it correctly, uh, the double canvas was added. And in the right corner, you see the mm, red uh, color in a blue. It means, it shows that it was transferred because this is the rest of red, um, the red la layer, uh, which was, by which was painting was covered before transferring. So it's like the rest uh, which came inside of the painting and we cannot uh, remove it. And next please, um, we, can, we can go, yeah. Um, I need to say that um, this is, it was in Louvre, it was unusual exhibition for us. And this is the first time when we showed the painting all together with painting and the um, infrared uh, image because we show not only the painting itself, but we came very deep in the painting just to see the changes, uh, how it was painted by Leonardo. And looking on such um, infrared image on the right side, which was in the exhibition, you can see it had many, many changes. Uh, and Leonardo, it's like, um, he wasn't um, satisfied, let's say, when he started this painting. Could you please show next, um, Helen? Yes, these are um, drawings which were in the exhibition uh, and uh, which, maybe we think uh, were um, the preliminary draw drawings uh, for this uh, painting. We cannot say exactly, but this is an idea. And uh, in the left side, you can see the um, Madonna, uh, Madonna with fruits, and it is very close to our painting by some changes. And we go rather to the next. Um, 
Yes, uh, for example, this is very good uh, image. Uh, we show infrared image very close to, to see um, some curls on the head of a child as yes, on the, in the um, up and in the side uh, next to temple. Yes, and um, we go to, next, to the next one, uh, the, the next um, to see, um, yes, uh, especially it is very uh, clear to see from the distance. You see that Leonardo wasn't satisfied to show, um, to pose uh, his, the arm of a um, child. And the one was, the first one was shorter and smaller. And you see that it was some changes in this painting. So this is why we think that sketches are very close uh, to this painting, but they are a little bit different. And we go rather uh, to the next. Um, yes, um, if you see the, the lines on the neck and shoulders of Madonna and some changes of um, hairstyle, you see that it was very common for Leonardo um, to change line, uh, the first one, the second, the third. So he tried to, to find um, a shape. Uh, a model and he rotate, let's say he turned all around the model and we go uh, to the next one. Um, it is very close um, to the adoration of a magi, magi um, to the, the painting. It's just a fragment, but the, the panel was just newly restored uh, in the Uffizi gallery. So if you can come how we can compare, this panel wasn't finished, it wasn't completed. And if you look in an infrared uh, panel, or Madonna Benoa, you can see that it is very close. For example, heads of Madonna, um, the type of a body of a um, child. So we see it's very, very close, especially the face and how the shadow was at. And um, the next, please. Um, I uh, use this um, large uh, scale uh, fragment to show that Leonardo also used the, his um, uh, sketch um, made of uh, charcoal, for example, as a, um, um, how to say, um, as a medium. For example, as you can see the trace of a charcoal on the face very close and the layers of uh, oil painting were transparent. And you can see that it's like the back drawing um, and the drawing is a clear in this uh, panel. And, but unfortunately, you cannot see it uh, when you are in the museum. You need to look very close to understand that the, the drawing was used as a medium for Leonardo in this panel. And we go uh, to the next. Yes, and I also need uh, to touch the problem of um, medium of um, oil painting. We know exactly that uh, the workshop of um, Andrea del Verrocchio was like experimental and they like to use uh, different um, types of experiments in the um, practice. And we know that this panel was painted um, but the majority of this panel was painted in oil painting, like one of the first examples of oil painting in the in uh, Italian in, uh, practice. But at the same time, we know that Leonardo used tempera, traditional uh, tempera painting, just to to add the to and to cover this painting. For example, you can see some traces of white color. This is tempera, or sometimes we can say this is like grass tempera or this is mixture not exactly oil and not exactly tempera traditional one and we go rather to the next the last one yes um i just wanted to to start on this brooch because um this is very good example to say that um before we sent this painting to the Louvre Museum, of course, we had uh, some kind of examinations, X-rays, ultraviolet and X, um, uh, infrared. And what we discovered that this brooch of uh, Madonna it was originally painted by Leonardo from the very beginning that was uh, like the central part of a composition which was not changed. Uh, by Leonardo. Even we saw different lines and different uh, shapes of a neck, head, arms, but the uh, brooch wasn't changed. And this is very close to the practice of Verrocchio. And you can see I showed you 
other uh, objects, other, other paintings of Leonardo da Vinci, such brooches, the, the tradition came from the Rocky workshop. And I started uh, my talk from um, the time of the Rocky workshop that Leonardo just left this workshop. But even he, he was an independent artist. He was very close to his artist, uh, master and uh, his tutor. And he continued this tradition to use such type of approach as a Florentine type of uh, Verrocchio uh, Bottega, let's say in Italian. Well, um, and I feel that we need to stop on this uh, talk, but just to add the one um, very special um, I, um, information. Uh, we, when we sent the panel, uh, the painting to the Louvre Museum, to the exhibition, it was not only the exhibition, and we were of course uh, glad to take part in such very special exhibition, but uh, after the exhibition, we didn't stop. We continued um, our um, exchange. Uh, and for example, uh, we had examination in the scientific laboratory of Louvre. Um, we started this panel and we are waiting for some results. So the, um, our uh, exchange didn't stop on this exhibition because we will continue later. And uh, this is why. Uh, yep. Thank you, Zoya. That's really, really interesting. And that actually leads me to my um, first question that I wanted to ask is if this if this kind of um, research that you were able to do on the Benoit Madonna, um, you know, was part of, of the, the decision to, to lend it to this show, and Vincent, if that was part of the negotiations for securing works, um, was this further kind of study um, and in-depth, you know, um, scientific and art historical research that could be done on them, um, it sounds like that was the big takeaway. This wasn't just a blockbuster show to that, you know, um, included amazing works, but it, you also were able to do research as curators and historians into the works. Um, can you tell us a bit about, was that part of the, of the loan agreements? Um, you know, part of, part of the discussion about why a work should, should be kind of lent to this kind of show? Um, no, that, that was not exactly, um, that wasn't the main idea from the first step. That was the second uh, idea, um, uh, to use this possibility um, to discuss this painting with the um, scholars, specialists, and to make examinations, to, to discuss what kind of examinations we have, to use uh, new uh, technology uh, for examinations. And um, actually, uh, first of all, we decided to learn uh, the painting and not only after we continued our talk that maybe we can do something um, extra and this is a very interesting uh, experience and important experience because it shows that we not only with not only um, in the exhibition, we have very deep uh, negotiations, uh, not only for public, but only inside for the museums, just for exchange of information, because Louvre is like the base of Leonardo science and Leonardo knowledges, and why not? Yeah, and Vincent, can you tell us a bit, was that, was, was the Louvre's resources and, and it's kind of, um you know, curatorial knowledge and, and in-depth kind of um, expertise on this? Was that part of the, part of the conversations that you would have with museums? Yes, clearly it was something uh, really important because uh, as you know, we have five paintings by Leonardo da Vinci. We were able to study uh, the five works. Uh, we restored three of these, uh, of these works. And so uh, uh, we are able to uh, have uh, quite a good uh, and objective information about uh, Leonardo da Vinci's technique. We have also a great collection of uh, paintings by uh, uh, pupils of Leonardo da Vinci. And you know that still today, there are a lot of uh, debate about the attribution, uh, sometimes about uh, the attribution of some works uh, given to Leonardo da Vinci. I, I think about the Yad Wonder Madonna. There are two Yad Wonder Madonna. They were both in the exhibition. There is still today a, a debate uh, between the two. Uh, there, uh, what are these uh, painting? And uh, I think that uh, uh, proposing to uh, uh, lenders to, to study their work uh, in our laboratory uh, uh, was an argument because you know we are able today to compare in a more uh, objective way uh, the technique of uh, each painting. And I think uh, 
uh, this was uh, really the, the base of our uh, exhibition. That's great. And I, I want to um, allow some time for, um, for audience questions as well. So please do submit your, your questions on the Q&A um, platform, everyone out there. Um, but um, you, you mentioned, Vincent, that um, uh, you know, there's very few works by Leonardo, and a lot of times that, that's been pointed to as, as art not being his number one priority. Um, but you've told us at the art newspaper that the real reason is because education uh, execution was more important than conception to him, which I think is a very, um, very interesting kind of take. Is this this working on a working on a painting for a really, really long time um, to build up these sfumato layers? Um, how did you show that through the show? How did you explain that through the show? That kind of really in-depth um, perfectionist um, view that he took to his painting. How did that come across? Well, this is absolutely fascinating because uh, in the exhibition you could uh, um, understand how the first paintings by uh, Leonardo da Vinci were uh, really absolutely finished. Everything is absolutely perfect. I think, uh, for example, uh, of the Annunciation uh, in the Uffizi, which is probably the first painting by Leonardo da Vinci. He's obsessed by the perfect form and everything is perfectly finished. And then uh, with his first maturity at uh, the end of the 1470s, he become to he, he starts to let his paintings unfinished. Uh, Zoya showed the the wonderful adoration of the Magi, which is the first painting left unfinished by Leonardo da Vinci. But this was really the uh, the beginning. Uh, if we think uh, about the the last paintings uh, of Leonardo da Vinci, uh, the Saint Anne, the Mona Lisa, the Saint John, they were started. Uh, at the beginning of the uh, 16th century, and he kept them during more than 15 years, and regularly he worked on them, he perfected uh, them, and in the exhibition we could uh, uh, show that thanks to uh, first, I should say, the preparatory drawings uh, which were uh, 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 on loan next to the painting, I think, uh, uh, on, uh, of the Saint Anne. Uh, it's a painting for which we have a lot, a lot of preparatory drawings, and they show that he regularly changed his mind. But what, what was also very important was to show uh, uh, each original painting with its uh, infrared reflectography. It was an occasion uh, for the general public to uh, really uh, get inside the painting because you could discover uh, the many changes made by the artist. It was like if you were in his workshop uh, behind him and looking at him uh, changing his mind. This is, I think, it had a, it had a great success uh, and it could explain uh, how, what was painting for Leonardo da Vinci, uh, a science, the supreme science, and uh, you know, uh, 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 an art which needs a lot of time. And that's why he died with his last uh, three masterpieces and finished, which are today in the Louvre Museum. That's great. And we, we have a few questions um, from the audience um, that kind of leads off from this. Um, Plastric asks, um, what discovery made in researching and preparing for the exhibition surprised you most? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> with Zoya as well, if you came, if you came home with some, some big surprises about the Benoit Madonna, please tell us. <laughs> we, are, we are still, examinating and actually the um, all examinations are done already and uh, now we started reading you know um to to understand what we saw in this panel and what kind of changes we can see and these are changes or these are some new things but not uh the the late changes of uh, restores for example so we are still working on uh, such um uh, examinations Surprises still to come. Vincent, any surprises oh. from, from the Louvre's works? Yeah, well, sure, you know, uh, one of the main uh, things I have been able to do during all that uh, work and, and we discovered it, it was really imp very important for Leonardo da Vinci was to understand uh, uh, the long period during uh, which he was working on his, uh, on his uh, paintings. And uh, we discovered the importance of uh, the copies done uh, in his uh, studio. Uh, Leonardo had several uh, 
pupils with him and uh, very often they made uh, copies of the composition at a certain moment of its uh, story and these copies are like we discovered that they were like um, photography pictures of uh, the composition at a certain moment when you look when you study these all copied they are never they are never never copying the last state of the composition but an intermediate state of the composition and that was absolutely fascinating because we discovered that these old copies helped us a lot to um, um, uh, understand in a better way the scientific uh, uh, images we had uh, thanks to uh, the XRF scanning, the infrared reflectography. You know, it's not easy to read uh, these uh, scientific images. You need a lot of time. And we discovered that looking at copies done in the studio, we were able to uh, understand many details in uh, the original uh, looking at the at the scientific images of the of the uh, of the um, of the of the painting and this is true what i discovered and when what uh, i think was fascinating i discovered that that was true for all the composition invented by leonardo since uh, the vision of the rocks i should say thank you that's really interesting and and someone asks um morina maturo asks um did I understand correctly, is the Mona Lisa considered an unfinished painting? You said a lot of the works in, in the Louvre's collection were unfinished. Is that included in those? Well, when you look at uh, the Mona Lisa, you feel that uh, she, the painting is absolutely finished. But it's always like that with uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. The face is clearly uh, mostly, probably mostly finished, even if probably Leonardo would have changed uh, many details and even would have uh, improved uh, his technique of sumato, adding uh, glazes of, uh, of, uh, of painting. And uh, what is clearly unfinished is the landscape. When you look at the painting uh, on the right part, the landscape, the intermediate landscape uh, is clearly uh, unfinished. He just put uh, uh, a few uh, uh, elements of painting, but left it and finish exactly like in the same time, you have the same kind of unfinished landscape in the same time with the uh, brown uh, color. Great. And um, Matt P asks, um, uh, you, you discuss a bit about the, the number of works that are, that are you know, recognized as Leonardo's own hand. And there's a variation in discussion about that. Can you talk about um, what the, variation where that kind of comes from and what are the two works that um, that kind of why some people say 15 and why some people say 17? Yes, well, you know, Zoya spoke very well about that. You know, when we started to, uh, you know, during a long period, during all the centuries, the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, many paintings were given to Leonardo da Vinci, more uh, hundreds of paintings. And it was only at the end of the 19th century when uh, the history of art uh, began that uh, uh, scholars were able to compare in a better way uh, all the paintings given to Leonardo da Vinci. And at the end from 100 uh, paintings, we are today with only uh, uh, no more than uh, 20 paintings. So today there is uh, um, like, uh, I think a consensus about 15 paintings, but still today some works remains uh, uh, matter of, uh, of debate because uh, uh, they look like sometimes they look closer to a, a pupil or sometimes also because those uh, paintings are not on display in a museum. I'm thinking about uh, the two Yad Wonder Madonnas. We, one is in a private collection so it's you know it's difficult to give um, an ID uh, on a painting you can't study uh, uh, in a good manner uh, because it's not on display in a museum. So that's why still today there are a, a debate. But I'm sure that thanks to uh, the scientific investigation and the comparison we are able to do today uh, uh, between uh, the recognized uh, masterpiece by Leonardo da Vinci and the works done by his pupil, I think we will be able to um, uh, go further in a more uh, objective manner. 
Thank you. I yeah, just, uh, just would like to, uh, to add uh, that it's very important that the state museums like the Louvre and the Hermitage Museum and which uh, the Uffizi Gallery are like the base for Leonardo's study and we can, we have uh, such way the possibility to compare with the just newly discovered painting which is like some, uh, for example, private uh, collector would like to show as Leonardo. So we have possibility, we have the base to compare with um, new painting that we have, the stable paintings, which are Leonardo. And we've had several questions about the Salvatore Mundi, which I think is, is probably the, the, the best known Leonardo work that very few people have seen since its sale. <laughs> um, it's kind of a $450 million um, sale. Um, and there was um, discussion about it being in the show, but I know, um, you know, it didn't, it didn't end up in the show. Um, we, we have some um, audience members who'd like to get your thoughts on the attribution of the Salvatore Monday and um, what you think about it. Is, it. is it a Da Vinci work? Is it not a Da Vinci work? Is it, is it I mean, Vincent, you were gonna include it in the show. Um, Sure, it was, we asked for, uh, for the painting and the exhibition because as a, a new painting, well, it was on display in the National Gallery London uh, in 2011 and 12. Uh, and at that time, almost nobody spoke about that uh, painting on its colors, uh, discovered uh, it. So it was really interesting to ask for the painting and to present it, a painting that can be seen, uh, to present it with uh, secure uh, paintings by uh, the master. So, you know, uh, in France, the French law uh, forbid uh, uh, curators, national curator, to give an attribution if it's not part of, uh, of a project. So, I have a clear idea on that painting, sure, uh, and I spoke about that idea to the owner, but uh, unfortunately, uh, at the painting it never came, I was not able to uh, uh, present my, uh, my idea. But as I told you uh, today, I think that uh, thanks to uh, not only uh, our capacity to compare the style of paintings, but also thanks to uh, many uh, scientific, uh, more objective elements given by the scientific investigation, I'm sure that uh, um, a consensus will uh, uh, begin on that, uh, on that painting because uh, it, can, it can be compared with other uh, paintings done by Leonardo and by his uh, pupil. For example, uh, in the exhibition, we were able to present a very a wonderful uh, version of the Salvatore Mundi. We proposed that version as a, 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 a pupil version, a very nice uh, personality in the studio, who uh, an artist who made several copies after uh, Leonardo's invention. And that copy has um, uh, clear um, characteristics and different compared to uh, Leonardo's work. So. If the painting of Salvatore Mundi, the famous Salvatore Mundi, I wish it will be uh, on display uh, in a museum in uh, the forthcoming year, and I wish it will be published with uh, uh, great uh, analysis uh, uh, to help uh, all the scholars to have a clearer idea on it. I, I wish it gets exhibited in a, in a museum as well. I think that would be um, fascinating. Let's see where it is. Um, we also have a, a question from Carolina Dalfo in Brooklyn, which I think is really interesting. Um, Leonardo absorbed so much from science and studied it to fuel his work. What can science learn from Leonardo? Is there anything that, um, any lessons we can take today from, from his, his kind of research? I don't know if Zaya wants to speak, but uh, sure. Uh, Leonardo had, a, uh, you know, he was a man, uh, of the 15th and 16th century, it was a, a period before the real science. Uh, many times, uh, Leonardo was wrong uh, in his, uh, uh, in his uh, conclusions, but he uh, used to uh, observe uh, uh, nature and uh, uh, many times, uh, uh, you know, science uh, tends to, uh, the science born in the 17th century tends to uh, uh, be careful about observation, direct observation. Leonardo uh, is more a man of observation and our modern science, our contemporary science goes back to uh, that 
I think, and Leonardo, I think, is a model on that, on a, a science less, uh, um, uh, how should I say that? A, a science, he's a model in a way, in, in the vision of the science, more looking more uh, at uh, uh, nature of uh, the observation. Um, I just uh, let few words, um, just can add a few words about Leonardo by my opinion. If you look in his um, history or some works of art, you can find that for Leonardo, for example, it wasn't very interesting to show antiquity, who wasn't very interested in it. And what we usually say about the high renaissance, that this is the renaissance of antiquity. And um, if you look on drawings of Leonardo da Vinci, you can discover that um, antiquity for him, very interesting only because it's the possibility to show the nature, to study nature, to show the type of um, river, uh, the wind, the flower, only this way. And only after pupils of Leonardo, they already discover antiquity and they show it um, thanks to Leonardo practice. This is an, my opinion that that was more interesting for him nature, the nature than uh, the history, for example. <laughs> Absolutely. And Zoya, uh, we, have a, we have another question from you from Batia. You mentioned that Barrison and his interest in traveling to view the picture in person. person um, do you feel that um, this science of the infrared images would have been useful for him? And is there a feeling that comes from being in the presence of the Leonardo that's lost when we look at the images on the screen? Um, which is probably something a lot of people would like to know what, what, it's, what it's like seeing these works. And um, Could you repeat the last few words? Because sure. the, uh, yeah. the, the first part of the questions was, do you feel that science would have been useful, the infrared science? Um, studying for the for the Benoit. Do you think that would have been useful um, to Berenson? Um, and the second part is, is there a feeling that comes from being in a presence of a Leonardo that's lost when you look at images of the screens? So maybe you could talk about the science bit first. What that uh, Yeah, um, uh, absolutely. Uh, the infrared image uh, was very useful and the, this is the possibility to study uh, Leonardo practice, how he changed his painting, how he moved uh, beginning from the uh, preparatory drawing to the end, uh, to the last layer. And um, for example, some uh, layers, they are just disappeared. And uh, sometimes you even cannot see if, for example, uh, painting was transferred from panel to canvas, you cannot see some details, like uh, from in, in for, um, uh, x rays, uh, you just cannot see uh, some. Um, preparatory drawings, um, but infrared was very interesting. And um, what was the second, it was, uh, how it was The second part of the question is, is, is what's, what's the experience of like, of seeing these Leonardo works in person, which I think everybody, you know, would, would love to have that experience of having that kind of close up study with these works. What's that experience? Like? Um, no, I just need to say that this experience is very important because we can compare, for example, um, if I got right, uh, correct, uh, for example, we have some replicas and some uh, copies, even we have uh, um, Mona Lisa in our collection, replica of the 16th century. So this study of infrared um, drawing, for example, is very useful because we can see not only from the first look, let's say, uh, how it was done, this painting, but if you go inside deeper, we can feel, we can um, see the difference that the, it was made by artists who was inventor, but, or it was made by artists who was like copyist. And this is why it's, it's very important in the practice. Great. Well, I know everybody um, would probably like to spend another hour talking about Leonardo. I think he's an artist none of us can get enough of. Um, but that's all the time we have for this discussion. Um, I want to thank the National Arts Club again for bringing us together. And thank you so much, Vincent and Zoya, for joining me today. Um, and thank you to our audience. I hope you enjoyed the event. Um, uh, read more about Leonardo at the art newspaper. We, we definitely love covering him. So you'll see a lot of news there. And I'm looking forward to finding out about the, the further um, research and, um, you know, um, information that you're, you, you will find out about uh, Leonardo's works from this show. 
Um, thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye. Goodbye, it was a pleasure to see you all. Thank you very much, bye.